Hey friends, my name is Kurt Willems. I'm the host of Theology Curator, and we've got a great episode for you today. N.T. Wright is on the show. That's going to be so special. I love my conversation that we got to have together. But before I do that, I wanted to share with you something that honestly is a huge honor to finally talk about. That's my first book. It's called Echoing Hope, How the Humanity of Jesus Redeems Our Pain. And I don't know about you, but this has been a hard year. This has been a hard season of life. And we all have those seasons, whether it's during a pandemic or other things that come up, right? And this book is really a space where I get raw and honest about my own pain, my own struggles, and my own joy, and and try and look at the life of Jesus through the lens of how pain and hope intersect. And so, my friends, I want to invite you to check out this book. It's not going to be out until a couple of weeks before Easter. So right now it's available for pre-order, and you can check it out at any place you can buy books. Again, it's called Echoing Hope, How the Humanity of Jesus Redeems Our Pain. And I am just so grateful for all of you who have stepped into the journey with me online through your um, support, your friendship, your encouragement encouragement and all of that stuff. And I really, truly hope that this book will be something that can be used by you to come alongside your spiritual journey and help you just simply hold pain, hold hope, and step forward into a new kind of human existence with Jesus. With that said, my friends, let's step into the episode. We've got N.T. Wright. It's going to be good. Let's go. All right. Well, I'm excited to be sitting with N.T. Wright, someone who's had a huge influence on my life over the years in various forms. I, uh, you know, before before I even let you speak, let me tell you about that just a little bit. Um, we've been talking, so <laughs> um, I I was thinking about it this morning about um, your like how I became acquainted with your work, and I remembered I was in college. I was doing. Yeah, internship ministry. I was in youth youth ministry at that time, and I was at a conference, and your name just came up by someone. And you've got to read this Tom Wright, and I thought to myself, okay, I'll I'll eventually track that down. Eventually did, and you know, I, I just got to tell you, some of the deepest memories from college are commutes. When I'm driving, I'd gone to the old NT Wright page, downloading audio files to CD. You know, at that point, this is probably 2003, 2004. Right. And just, I, I would listen to your lectures on repeat and I would just wow. absorb and uh, just so, so grateful for how accessible you've made the things you put out there. And eventually I read a book called Simply Christian and a ton more as I've done graduate work, of course. And uh, I just am so thankful for another chance to sit with you and talk. So thanks oh, again. Thank you. That, that's great. I mean, it, it's been a funny life for me. I didn't think when I was small that I would grow up and be a writer, but that seems to have been what's happened um, because I keep on thinking things which nobody else seems to be saying, and I may as well try and write them out and see what happens. And that's so it's, it's kind of feeling my way. And if that's helped other people en route, then that's great. Maybe that's what it was all about. Yeah, no, I, I really huge help. I mean, I think I think the new creation emphasis was earth shattering to use some of your language, right? I mean, this was huge for me. And, uh, and I was also wrestling with end times, these stuff in general at that point. And, uh, yeah. you know, it just sort of gave me this bigger framework. And then of course I've gone, I've gone to other places with uh, your work and appreciated it. Um, and, and one of the things I remember was I, like I said, I think Simply Christian was the first book that I read by you. And so to come full circle, we're talking about this book today, Broken mm -hmm. Signposts, How Christianity Makes Sense of the World. And it's this sort of um, second edition almost. I mean, it's radically different in a lot of ways, but you've basically expanded and taken a thread and run with it with John's gospel. And so um, I'm excited to talk about that. But before we get too far, um, for the few people who might be watching or listening, uh, catch us up. How how did you step into uh, scholarship and writing, and um, mm. what are you up to these days? <laughs> well, and, I, I, <laughs> yeah, that's an I easy question. Into, I, came into, I came into scholarship because when I was studying as an undergraduate, I was doing philosophy and ancient history, and both of which I loved. Um, and when I was finished with that, I actually had a little flicker of maybe I ought to be a philosopher, and wouldn't that be fun? I'd stay on in Oxford and and, and teach philosophy. 
and after a week or two of thinking that, I thought, no, actually, uh, my basic calling is to ministry, and that means I do want to study theology of the Bible. So I went to seminary and did that, and c combined the two, because the philosophy and the ancient history are all still there. And the more I was studying the theology and the Bible, the more I realized that there were vistas of things that were opening up that I and some others were seeing that many people in the church, including people who are genuinely good hearted and wanting to believe the Bible, just weren't getting what was actually going on about the kingdom mm. of God, about who Jesus was, about some aspects of Paul's theology, etc. So I started in writing and I've always enjoyed writing. Uh, I, had I had a different life that I could have done in parallel, I would like to have been a, a musical composer. I've never yeah. been a musical composer, but music has always been important to me. And I see my writing as kind of the closest that I get to that, trying to woo people in to listen to the tune and see where it's going and how it develops and so on. Um, so then, inevitably, as a scholar, I've done a great deal of teaching in various universities and colleges and so on. And and you quickly discover what it is that the students instinctively know about and what it is that they basically don't know about and need explaining. And particularly then, both students and in the church, discovering the things which people have got in their heads, which they think are mainstream Christianity, but which are in fact not what the Bible and the earliest church was all about. And so there's constantly an unlearning and a relearning process. And that intellectually, that's fun. Um, sometimes yeah. it's very frustrating, but it's been it's been exciting. And so um, the various projects that I've had, I mean, Simply Christian, which you mentioned, the publishers asked me if I would do that as a little book, really to be rather like C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. Mm. Um, it's like it in some ways and unlike it in others. But that was an opening up of a possibility for me, which... Yeah. gets me into the world of what some people have called apologetics, um, though I don't do apologetics the way that many people in America think of it. It's not a rational um, move from first principles all the way up to saying, therefore, there is a God or anything. But it's a way of saying, as at the beginning of Simply Christian, and so as throughout Broken Signposts, um, that, that there are these things which are common to all hum humankind. Um, uh, an instinct for justice yeah. and for spirituality yeah. and for relationships and beauty. And then um, in this book, obviously, I had three more, freedom and truth and power. And of course, what's come in between Simply Christian and Broken Signposts is that I did the Gifford Lectures in Aberdeen a couple of years ago, uh, which is published under the title History and Eschatology. And I used the image of Broken Signposts in chapter seven of that book, um, in a more philosophical context and granted the argument of that whole book, that's how it went. Um, but in a similar way to what I'm doing here. Um, and so it, then uh, I was discussing with my colleague who helps me run the uh, NT Write online, online courses. And we decided as a thought experiment that we would do a course where I took those seven themes and thought about John's gospel in relation to them. And that mm. seemed like a really off the wall, quirky thing to do. But there is so much in John about justice and freedom and truth and so on, which many people miss. But I thought this is worth trying it. And I think I think it works. I think it's an introduction to John, but also an introduction to this kind of apologetics there. I've said far too much, but I hope that. Makes oh, sense. oh, no, no, no. I mean, that totally makes sense. And and I love I love that you focused on one like passage of scripture. And to be honest, you know, as someone who knows your work, it's it's not an area you've done a lot of um, extra right. work on, right? I mean, you don't have right. a big book right. on the Johannine right. material or anything like no. that. No. And so no. it's a treat in that sense. Yeah. yeah. Which is fun. I mean, I've always loved John and I've preached on John a lot and so on. But uh, because the debates about who Jesus was in his historical context have over the last 30 years focused on the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And because I wanted to contribute to that debate, I haven't used John nearly so much because if you walk into that debate with John under your arm, three quarters of the other people in the room will just say, oh, well, you're not serious because right. John is about something different entirely. So I haven't agreed with them, but for the sake of being part of that debate, I've stuck with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, and so, yeah, John has been there waiting his turn. And this is a way of saying, let's just bring John into the conversation and see what happens. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Um, in fact, I'm going to pause just for a second because my dog is doing that weird thing where she needs to get out of the door. Um, okay, sure. 
Go. Here we go. <laughs> All right, good girl. Go on. She'll likely push her way back in, and we'll we'll just let it be what it is. Um. Oh, that's All hilarious. Right. Yeah, great. You have a dog coming and going. I have a daughter coming and going. <laughs> hey, hey! Uh, I hope I hope when uh, I get to that stage in my life that I have daughters coming and going too. I've got two of them. So, <laughs> good, good, good. oh man, okay. So, so in this book, in one of the things I noticed was, uh, and it, it wasn't the first time you've done this, but you've taken this image of broken signposts. So I. Through the years, you've said signposts. Signposts of new creation is something I've heard you say a lot of times. Talk to us about the broken nuance. I think it's significant and it's helpful, but um, what what is that all about? Okay, it, it, what it's all about is the common perception. And when I say common, I mean across humankind, across cultures and across history, that we, let's take the first one, justice. We all know justice matters, children know it's important to be fair and they sense unfairness and, and, and so on. And they say that's not fair, not because they've taken a course in moral philosophy, because just they know it in their bones, um, what fairness and unfairness might look like. However, children too know that if they really want that piece of cake, but if there are four other people in the room, nevertheless, they want it that much, they're prepared to say, oh, well, I'm more hungry than you, even if yeah. the others say that's not fair. In other words, um, justice matters but we're all prepared to bend it in our own interests. Uh, mm. And of course, chase that one up to global international relations. We all believe in global justice, and yet we still have cold wars and we have trade wars and we have um, you know, hacking of computers between national systems and so on. We're all trying to gain an advantage. And then yeah. if something goes wrong for us, we'll all run to the UN or to some court of human rights and say, oh, so-and-so is being unfair. And the answer is actually, we're probably all being unfair and we need, to, we need to figure that out. So we all know justice matters. It appears to be a signpost pointing to the truth about what it means to be human, but it's always broken. Ditto with love, um, my would be without love if somebody can exist without love we normally say that this person is very severely maladjusted you know the love of parents of family yeah. of friends etc is what makes us who we are and yet even though we know that we mess up our relationships this way or that for whatever reason and half the great, probably more than half, the great novels and plays and poems in the world are about the ways in which relationships are both beautiful and broken. Hmm. Um, and, and the best ones still end in death. And then the same argument runs with spirituality, but most human beings, at least, unless they're very determined secularists, shall we say, um, know that there are other dimensions to life beyond the merely material. Um, but many people, most people perhaps, find that, that those other dimensions sometimes go dark and sometimes they can be apparently malevolent. We can get into some very bad and damaging stuff if we go down the wrong lines there. Ditto with beauty and then particularly with, with freedom and truth, um, that we all know freedom matters, but so many human freedoms are bought, purchased at the cost of somebody else's slavery uh, and so on and so forth. And the history of the enlightenment has been all about that. Um, with truth, we all know that truth matters, and yet we all know that there is such a thing as fake news and that it's much harder to tell the difference between fake news and truth than we used to think. Um, yeah. And that many people tell big lies and make a lot of people believe them and make a lot of people live in accordance with them, and then it actually becomes true. Uh, and, and so what on earth does truth mean? And then mm. power, the last one. You can't get anywhere in the world without power. If we say nobody should have any power, then what will happen will be that the bullies and the bad guys will come in and say, oh, good, everyone else has gone away. We'll clean this place up. So we need power. We need authority. We need people to be um, uh, rulers, leaders, guides, uh, cops, etc. cetera. Um, but we all know that that too gets messed up and that power, as Lord Acton said, tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely and the history of politics yeah. is the history of that and sadly the history of families is the history of that hmm. you know you get a father who says i've read my bible and fathers are in charge here so you get out of the way and you do this and you do what i tell you and the whole thing falls apart yeah. or it's a deeply deeply dysfunctional and dehumanizing setup so so th these things in other words 
we all know that these are signposts to what a genuinely human life might be. And if insofar as there is a belief in God, maybe this is something to do with how God made the world. But then we discover that these have all collapsed. And then we could just sit back like Jean-Paul Sartre and say, well, life is just a sick joke. It looks as though it's doing stuff, but actually it's meaningless. It's hopeless. And you, mm. all you can do is just get on and have another drink or make the best of life as you can, because it doesn't actually mean anything. And at that, that point, and this was what yeah. excited me about chapter seven of the Gifford Lectures. And I remember where I was standing at the point <laughs> where this dawned on me that the point where all the signposts are broken is the point where Jesus is going to the cross. The, the story of Jesus going to the cross is a story of justice being denied, of freedom being trampled on, of power being abused, of love going cold with people denying and betraying him, etc. Yeah. And then you realize that, that, that that's one of the reasons why the story of the cross is so compelling, because we all know in our bones that these broken signposts are broken. But instead of saying, oh, dear, that means we can't point up to God anymore. We discover in the story of Jesus that God has come down to the place where the signposts are broken to meet us right there. And that, I think, is both the meaning and the power of wow. the good news of Jesus. Oh, man, man. That that sounds like a really uh, you just preached it. I mean, that's that's good. That's good. I'm feeling I'm feeling all kinds of good things right now. <laughs> I mean, it, it is that that sequence of thought. It's one of those things. As I, say, I know exactly where I was when I first I've been wrestling with all this for, for ages. And ah, there it is. Get home and write it up quick. And so the Gifford Lectures, History and Eschatology, that, that's that's really one of the climax moments of that that book. But then this book is a more popular level book where I decided, well, John's gospel tells the story of Jesus in terms of kingdom and truth and power and freedom mm -hmm. and all these things, which mm -hmm. they come out so strongly. So let's run the story with John's gospel as the counterpoint and watch. what. Yeah. Happens. Oh, wow. And I I love, uh, you know, I don't want to just stay on this point, but one thing I love about the way you framed it, um, you have these these, uh, you know, seven sign signposts, but you also by using John's gospel, you have these cool little interludes between the chapters and sometimes they're about this nugget that you just hope to highlight and uh and then you have one where it's about like connecting with jesus i don't know if you say it that way but um encountering jesus in john and i i just found those to be um just an added little gift because i think those are the the little connection points that i can imagine as a writer you know as someone who does some of this too that there's these things you want people to get to know about but they don't necessarily follow the flow of the the energy of the actual chapter and so you can have these parentheticals yeah. that are actually really valuable so yeah. that was another yeah. thing i noticed about the book good yes i for, for me that was a win-win and that these were things which i thought if i don't say something about these people may get the wrong impression at certain points in the john chapters or in in the main johanna exposition um but i didn't want them to be part of the main chapters because they would kind of get in the way at mm -hmm. the same time then it enables the book to breathe a bit just to sit back yeah. and say let's just take two or three pages and think about this in john and then hold that in your head and now let's plunge into the next theme. So I, I think that really did work. I'm glad you like yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, I do. I do. I do. I have a few of them earmarked to go back to you. So um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's very good. I, you know, I, I'm thinking about the seven broken signposts and I, I want to start, we, we've kind of had the big picture overview and I have a few questions, you know, maybe mm -hmm. one question about each and we can sure. stick with whatever feels natural in the next few minutes. But, sure. um, you know, justice, you start with justice and I think a lot of us, especially, you know, I don't know much about your context out, outside of what I experienced through your work and other, you know, distant stuff. I've, I've been in the U.S. my whole life, but um, I know here, especially the concept of justice is retributive, retributive always. I mean, that is it's retribution, just desserts. Um, of course, we've seen uh, the, the real deep ramifications of that as racism becomes clearer and, and systemically so, uh, death penalty, all these things. Mm -hmm. And and what I loved about your chapter was this section where you, you go from John 3 and you talk about, you know, the famous verse, for God so loved, but then you say, we often skip the next little section about 
hey, and there's this God loves in the kind of way that light is going to expose evil for what it is. And evil's evil needs to be on watch, essentially. Um, can you talk about our human longing for justice and Jesus's vision for it? I think you really get at some of that in this chapter. Yeah, uh, the, the, that chapter on justice is actually quite dense. And I did think when I reread the book recently that um, if I was doing it again, I might try to, to clarify that justice chapter particularly, but I hope hmm. it, it doesn't stop people getting to it. But the, the thing is this, in the Bible, justice is about God putting the world right. And, and the, the idea of putting something right, um, you know, I, I now cycle around Oxford and if, if the chain comes off, it needs to be put right. And if something gets broken, I need to take it to the shop and say, can you put this right? And that mm. means, in a sense, passing judgment on what's gone wrong. Ah, this chain shouldn't be on that way. It should be on this way. So we're going to say no to that in order to say yes to this. Yeah. So this justice thing is about saying the ultimate goal is to get the whole thing right and get people right and so on so we need to say no to the things that get people wrong to the things that dehumanize and distort and destroy human life and god's world the trouble has been that people have so seen that necessity of saying no that then that's all they're really interested in somebody's done bad things and they need to be punished and that's it uh, without really them thinking hang on, how can this be within the larger context of what in some countries they call restorative justice? Um, my wife used to yeah. work in the prison service here. And we, once we went to New Zealand, where in the prison service in New Zealand, they are very good on restorative justice. It's an old Maori concept, which the, the country has taken up, um, which is about getting together different bits of the community that have been hurt by whatever yeah. bad yeah. things have happened and saying with a larger group of people, how can we put this right? How can we restore a healthy community here? And that's not easy. In fact, hmm. it's often very painful. In a sense, it's what Desmond Tutu was doing in the Commission for Truth and Reconciliation in Southern Africa, um, trying to say the only way forward is through forgiveness, restoration, aiming at the ultimate goal of putting mm. things right. So John's gospel is like Paul's writings are about God putting the world right. And in order to do that, saying no to that which is corrupting the world, but it's got to be, the no has got to be the reflex of the big yes, which God intends to give. I know that mm. may sound like Karl Barth, but um, fair enough <laughs> to that point. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I point well said. And uh I appreciate your restorative justice um, conversation. You know, I come out of um, Anabaptist communities um, oh, yeah. traditionally, and the uh, restorative justice movement has been one of the things that Mennonites have really uh, tried to lean into out here and uh, creating spaces for victims and offenders to um, discern together um, what actually makes men amends here. Of course, there's po I would assume there's limits to that. I mean, murder and, you know, there, there's things sure. in some sense, but... Um, but, but, but yeah, the limits, are pro limits are probably further down the road than many people like to imagine. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that really, that's a good segue into love. Um, you know, I, I think you, you, you highlight so much here. I'm going to read one quote. I don't know if I'm going to get away with just one in the next, uh, 15 minutes, but let, let's try. So on page 55, this is probably one of my favorite in the whole book. You had said this, uh, but John is totally clear that this love embodied and dramatically lived out by Jesus himself in his utter seriousness and light touch playfulness comes to us through and only through the victory won on the cross over the dark distortions. It comes to us as part of a new creation. The resurrection says God's yes to the whole created order and with it to the love that all humans know in their bones is central to what it means to be human mm -hmm. where do we get this wrong without jesus and <laughs> and i don't mean that in some traditional sense of you got to be saved i of course i believe those core things but, sure, but there's sure. there's something missing when we just say go get your salvation or you know and that's what's missing there's something profound about humankind and what we're made to be absolutely and here just taking love as the parade example for the moment but with each of these seven once we've seen the brokenness and once we've seen 
the way in which the broken signposts in their brokenness point to the cross with Jesus coming to the place where justice is denied and love is trampled on and so on. Then we are called and enabled by the spirit to become people of justice, love, spirituality, etc., and in turn to become ourselves and our communities mended signposts so that people will see in our human lives and in the communities where we try to live this out, the genuine signposts. Um, and we'll see, oh, maybe that's what human life was supposed to be like. And mm. the, the, I, I have seen this in, in, in many places. Um, people who come from very sad and damaged backgrounds and dysfunctional homes. Um, my wife and I met uh, a couple recently who have had seven children of their own and who then, once wow. their children were, were more or less growing up and leaving, started to either foster or adopt other children, particularly fostering. Mm. And you're thinking, having had seven of your own, how can you do that? And the answer was, they were in good practice. He was a school teacher, she was a nurse, they knew about looking after kids. <laughs> and, and so they just got on with it. And many of these children would come into their home and for the first time experience normal family life with its ups and its downs and its wow. joys and its sorrows, but with a sense of the mm. security of being loved whatever um and you know mm. when people have never had that that's very very powerful it's a fine christian couple who've just done that that's one of the ways they've yeah. spent their lives and so but then that's what the church is supposed to be all about and sometimes you glimpse it and it really is sometimes church can become horribly dysfunctional too and full of backbiting and unloving stuff but at its best that's what it is it's a great yeah. big second family yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And that, uh, that's something that I think just comes through, uh, in a lot of your books. Um, but in this book in particular, I caught a couple of nuggets and, and I'm, I'm looking for these nuggets. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I wrote, I just submitted a book and it's about how the humanity of Jesus redeems our pain. And it really looks oh. at the life of Jesus through his humanity. Oh. Um, while also the divinity stuff, but, you know, mm -hmm. looking at him and saying, Let's let's step into the life of Jesus as a prototype for all humankind and for the new creation and 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 notice how Jesus steps into pain and helps us step into that pain. Yeah. And and I think I think what you just said about this family just embodies that because not only are they um they had to become particular kinds of people with Jesus to have the virtue to then extend their family beyond the seven, right? And they'd had a lot of practice. Exactly. Um <laughs> and and so I just see in that and I say, whoa, this is this is the redemption of uh, the brokenness of the signposts. And that's beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Who's publishing well, your book, by the way? Um, Waterbrook Press. So it's uh, okay. side. Yeah, they're part of uh, Random House, that crew. Uh, oh, so, okay. yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah, I'm very excited. It'll be out in March <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So. That leads me to this other next this next topic of spirituality. And and here's here here's what I, I'm curious about with spirituality. I I think of um well, it's funny, it's a funny word, and you really play with it a little bit because you know, in, in settings I grew up in, spirituality would have been this taboo sort of uh, uh, is that new age, you know, and then in other settings, it's it actually is kind of new age and there's that validity to that. And then in my life, it's like, no, this is how I'm becoming like this is how I connect with the God of that looks like Jesus. And it it's part of this becoming human thing. Um, there, there's something really integrated here. And so um, where have we gotten spirituality wrong and what is the jesus shaped spirituality you're you're pointing yeah. us towards it, it's, it's very interesting and uh, i mean i use the word spirituality uh, as a uh, we scholars say it's got an arm waving thing it's a, it's something out there you know um, yeah but yeah. nobody was using the word spirituality when I was a teenager. Um, I first heard it when I was in my mid twenties, people started to talk about different styles of spirituality. And that was a way of acknowledging, for instance, that there were people who I recognized as Christians, but in very different traditions from mine, who probably didn't uh, say their prayers in the way that I did, or didn't enjoy worship services of the kind mm. that I did, but that it was a way of saying, actually we are all different 
and maybe there are different styles of of spirituality of how you connect with god of how you um, as i would now say how you live at the dangerous interface between heaven and earth that's what it's all yeah. about um and and um of course then some people will say oh so um, hindus and buddhists and people they have spirituality as well well in a sense yes they do but i would say that actually the Jewish and the Christian tradition of the way in which heaven and earth come together mm. was fully and finally revealed and modeled and demonstrated in Jesus himself. He is the temple. He is the place where heaven and earth come together. That's what yeah. divine and human in Jesus is all about. And yeah. that the extraordinary thing about the gift of the Holy Spirit, um, which in a sense we never really understand, but from time to time we, as it were, look at ourselves in the mirror and say, this must have been the spirit at work, yeah. um, wow. whether or not it was seemed dramatic at the time, um, because it seems that here heaven and earth have come together. And that's, that's, I think, the best way of putting it. It's why, for me, John's gospel is so important, because it very explicitly and upfront has this picture of the temple. Jesus speaks of the temple of his body, mm. and we have um, Jesus speaking of himself in terms of Jacob's ladder, which is going up and down from heaven yeah. to earth. Um, and and he is the one who holds heaven and earth together and says, if you stick with me, then you too can be a heaven and earth person. And wow. that, as I've said, that's a very uncomfortable and difficult and often even dangerous place to live. Because when heaven and earth come together, one is opened up, one is vulnerable. There are um, wrong pathways that one can take. There are um, temptations which crowd in as Jesus himself found immediately after his baptism. Um, you know, this was a dangerous place to be, yeah. to be the place where the spirit descends and the voice says, you are my beloved child. Whoops, watch out, we're off to the wilderness now. So <laughs> so in, in case anyone would imagine that spirituality means, oh, that's nice, we escape into this uh, fuzzy sphere and we feel good about ourselves. Well, maybe yeah. you do, but often you don't. Often it means <laughs> you're in the middle of the battle because spirituality includes spiritual warfare as in ephesians 6 and so on so yeah it, 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 but 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 the word itself enables one to name a sphere of human existence within which these other things can then be teased out yeah wow no i think the the interlocking spheres imagery that you're bringing the temple imagery um mm. that's the kind of spirituality that i i continue mm. to yeah. Um, explore in my own life with Jesus. And I see in the New Testament now, you know, yeah, they're yeah, just yeah. all over the place. Uh, and yeah, yeah. And so, and so this uh, gets us, we've got three more here. We've got freedom, mm -hmm. truth, and power. And, and so on freedom, you, you talk a lot about Exodus. And, yeah. and this has been a theme in a lot of your work, the, the new sure. Exodus. And I, uh, I've seen it multiple places. In one spot here, and this is a short quote, you say, uh, on 120, you say, the Exodus, it turns out, is not only an event in Israel's past history, but a promise for the whole creation, a promise yeah. that Jesus makes real for all his followers. Yeah. And and that's been very meaningful for me over the years in, in my own just exploring of New Testament thought and um, sp how it connects to spirituality even. Um, talk to us about the the exodus overtones and that desire for freedom, because, um, you know, creation is groaning, as you've highlighted many times in Paul, and uh, we, we get these echoes of exodus more than we would probably notice unless we're looking for them. Absolutely. Um, for, for me now, it all lands with the fact that when Jesus knew that he had to go to Jerusalem and do what had to be done, he deliberately chose Passover as mm. the moment that would resonate exactly with what he knew his vocation was to do and be. Um, mm. In other words, to go to the cross and to, to take the burden of Israel's destiny and hence the world's destiny with himself into that place of horror and shame. Um, mm. And uh, ever since then, and, and, and of course, his last meal with his disciples, the, the, the Last Supper, was a sort of Passover meal, a Passover meal with a difference, and that was yeah. how Jesus explained what his death was going to be all about. Um, he didn't, as I've often said, he didn't give them a theory. He gave them a meal. Yeah. And we still have <laughs> Love that. that. And, and the meal does it and says it together. Um, it says, we are Passover people. We are freedom people because of the death of Jesus. 
and the other way around we are jesus people sharing this meal and therefore we are people of freedom freedom from yeah. sin freedom from death etc and so all the lines are radiating out in different ways and the early church knew that very well um so that well, paul can say things like christ our passover is sacrificed for us and he doesn't have to say by the way i assume you know what passover is and i assume you know that jesus died at passover yeah. time etc it, it's just part of the common stock of early christian understanding mm -hmm. and so we have to plug ourselves into that because then we become the people who are wandering through the wilderness on the way to the inheritance uh, uh, only as Paul makes clear, the inheritance isn't going to heaven. You know this stuff, but many people don't. Hey, the inheritance is the in, entire redeemed creation. Um, mm. That's that's the new world, the new heavens and new earth. So that Passover means the freedom from death, the freedom from sin, the freedom from the slavery of idolatry. That's what idols do. Yeah. They enslave you. And that's what was going on in Egypt, that the people were enslaved, not only politically, but religiously. That's why they had to come mm -hmm. out of Egypt to worship God in a place where they could worship God freely. Um, so that yeah. the, the construction of the tabernacle is so important, et cetera, et cetera. So, so then once we live in that story, we see it popping up with uh, all sorts of meaning and challenge right across the New Testament. Uh, and, and nudging us to be Passover people in so many ways. And, and that's why, of course, in Western culture, which has tried to get the benefits of Christianity without the Christian God, we mm. have wanted to have freedom in our own ways, thank you very much, which has <laughs> meant, morally speaking, often uh, just, just license, you do your own thing, whatever yeah. would do it, but also politically, um, we don't want God, we just want to be free, so we can do what we want. And as I said before, the trouble is one person's freedom is often purchased at the cost of another person's slavery. Yeah. And I think, you know, in 200 years when people write the history of the 20th and 21st century, I think they will look at Western Europe and at North America and say, yeah, they were free in a sense, and look at the cost. Why do you think every day there are people trying to cross the Mediterranean or the English Channel in small boats? to get from North Africa or Syria or or wherever it is into right. the West because they want what we've got. And the reason they want it is that we have purchased our freedom at the cost of their suffering and slavery. And these are huge issues yeah. which we don't resolve easily, but which we have to address if if we really believe in, in the gospel of Jesus. Absolutely. And people, you know, in my context, sometimes use their uh, ideals of freedom, which are very Americanized and, you know, uh, no, no, no. individualistic. And, and they'll say, I mean, even with wearing a mask, I, my freedom is being taken away or, or with restrictions on church gatherings, we're mm -hmm. being persecuted. And then I think about the, the frame of reference that you just gave about freedom and unfreedom. And I just think we don't really have any moral authority to be claiming those kinds of injustices, right, you know, right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And of course, the New Testament, both John and Paul and, and all over the place, use that argument that pre precisely because you're free people, you must now use your freedom to serve one another. Yeah. yeah. And, and to serve God. Um, but as I think I used the illustration to you earlier when we were just chatting, um, mm -hmm. am I free um, if I am driving a car down the road and have to stop when there's a red light, um, is that red light, light not a restriction on my freedom? And the answer is, yeah, you bet it is. And that's just mm -hmm. as well, because there are other people using this road as well. <laughs> yeah. and, and if you think your freedom demands you just go straight on, then watch out, because you may be the cause of your own death or that of someone else, and, and so on and so forth. Very interestingly, the parallel debate we had in this country about 30 years ago when Maggie Thatcher was our prime minister was about the mm. compulsory wearing of seatbelts in cars. And people oh, wow. used all, all that rhetoric about this is a restriction of our freedom. How dare these people think that they can tell us what we have to do in the privacy of our own cars? And then somebody showed Margaret Thatcher the statistics of what the National Health Service was paying to patch up people who had had road accidents without wearing seatbelts. And she changed overnight, seatbelts <sighs> compulsory. Um, wow. and, and actually it's common sense, but people were yeah. using the rhetoric of freedom in that silly, um, li licentious rather than libertarian way. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Wow, yeah, thanks for that parallel. And uh, 
Man, it's a it's a hard world we live in trying to represent the the Jesus we see in the New Testament and early church, and uh, it it takes um, it takes people giving voice to these broken signposts to actually allow them to point us into the the Jesus shaped freedom that yeah. uh, we deeply desire. And uh, you know, truth and power. Last two here, uh, yeah. truth. Yeah. Uh, here, here's my take on truth really quick. Not, it's not my take, it's my experience, unfortunately. Truth is sometimes, in some church contexts, uh, used with a capital T and, and maybe even all caps. And it's about evidence that demands a verdict. We've got to prove these things about Moses' authority in the first five books or evolution or you know any of these, these things, these debates. And so for a lot of folks that have kind of come out of those spaces and are saying, we, we want the, the real deal stuff over here. Uh, it can be, truth can almost be a triggering word. And, and that's, that's uh, uh, when it's, you know, because it's been framed so poorly. And so mm -hmm. the truth you're talking about, I think is a deeper kind of truth. It's a uh, truth with a proper noun kind of capital T. This is yeah. <laughs> a tr the truth is this person yes. um, and, and so much more than that, uh, yes. silly old debate. Yes, yes, it's fascinating, isn't it? I don't know if I quote it in this book, but I, I was very struck 20 years or so ago by reading the, the last book written by the great philosopher Bernard Williams, who was a, a secular mm. philosopher, but very, very wise and interesting man called Truth and Truthfulness. And it, it basically saying that we live in a world which is more and more suspicious and so is demanding more and more truth. We want to know the facts about what happened in that accident. We want to know the facts about who in the government mm. was fiddling this and whatever. But the only way we can do that is by having more and more surveys and getting more and more people to fill out forms and so on, which means that we all acquire filing cabinets full of documents in case somebody sues us because we were supposed to be on wow. top of that, whatever. Uh -huh. So he says, we are demanding more and more truth, but we are making it harder and harder for ourselves to get it. And that's hmm. the kind of postmodern moment where you think, oh, my goodness, is there any such thing as truth? Um, yeah, and I remember, remember when I first was in the Middle East, I spent a sabbatical there in spring 1989, and I talked to all kinds of people in Jerusalem and around about what was going on, what had gone on, etc. Everybody had a different story, which seemed pretty true when they told it to me, but no two or three of those stories would ultimately mesh with each other. And I just had to live with the fact that these were all passionately held beliefs they did relate to real things that had happened on the ground, but that everybody's take was significantly different from everybody else's. And it wasn't just two takes, it was like 10 or 20 or however many. Um, and, you know, in other words, life is much more complicated than we imagine. The danger with truth with the capitals all the way through like that, and then, as you say, evidence that demands a verdict, etc. That is one way in for doing a certain style of apologetics, but it's very brittle and it's very rationalist. And I think it comes to us out of the 18th century rational critiques of Christianity on the back of the Enlightenment and people like David Hume and Edward Gibbon and so on, sneering at Christianity as nobody believes all that stuff these days. Here are our reasons, here are the facts, et cetera, et cetera. And then that has generated uh, a breed of rationalist apologetics that says, no, no, we, we can play rationalism too. We start here and we go A, B, C, D, E, bang, there it is. Christianity is true. So if you don't see it, you're either stupid or wicked or quite possibly both. Um, mm -hmm. And I just think, uh, uh, that's a very modernist way of going about it. And that's one of the reasons for writing a book like this is to come at the central issues from several different angles, which aren't just about rationalistic truth, but about painting a picture or singing a song, which mm. makes sense of things and invites other people to join in. Um, does, does, that, yeah. does that make sense? Um, Absolutely, and, and, yeah. And then for, for me, one of the most telling moments in John's gospel is when Pilate says to Jesus, are you a king? And yeah. Jesus says, I've come to tell the truth. And you think, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it's a typical Johannine conversation yeah. where Jesus is answering the question Pilate should have asked. But actually, I think it's very profound because I think what Jesus is saying is, I am speaking the new creation into yeah. being. I am the Lord of the new creation. And when I am speaking, it's coming into being. And that's what my kingdom looks like. Hmm. And Pilate just says, well, what is truth? 
you know, because yeah. he's a postmodernist. He knows that we make our own truth around here, we Romans. You know, all, all empires yeah. make their own truths. We, we yeah. British made our own truth in the 19th century. You Americans make it in the 21st century. <laughs> and, uh, and, That's absolutely and right. We, 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 all, we all know it's it's a mess, but there it is. So I, I was and am fascinated by that notion at several levels. And John's Gospel is one of the places to get into it. Oh, my goodness. And it's a perfect segue into the last thought I had on power. We're uh, yeah, yeah, getting yeah. close to the tail end here. And this is sure. uh, you you're you look at Pilate some more in that chapter, if I recall. And, and what you end up doing is talking about the distinct nature of the kingdom of God. And now you're getting into some Anabaptisty stuff that I like. I mean, we, we have some differences, that's fine. But overall, we're in the same vein, I think, on this. And and so, you know, you talk about Jesus as taking up this vocation as the ultimately obedient human being. And then he shows us the, the radical difference between these two spheres of shaping reality. Can you just talk about that distinction that you're trying to draw out as we kind of come to a close here? Sure, sure. I mean, the distinction is very sharply made by Jesus himself in Mark chapter 10, where James and John say, we want to sit at your right and left. We want to be your, your right hand, your left hand men. Uh, we'll be your bodyguards, your um, director of operations, whatever. Yeah. Jesus says you've got the wrong model. That's mm. how the rulers of the world behave. Um, mm. There's a segue straight across there, by the way, to Philippians 2 verses 6 to 11, which is that amazing prose yeah. poem about he was in the form of God, but didn't regard that as something to exploit, et cetera, et cetera, and went the way of the cross. And therefore God has mm. highly exalted him because that is what power consists in, the self-giving love of the cross. So Jesus says, listen, the rulers of this age bully and boss people around. We're going to do it the other way. Let the one who wants to be great be your servant. The one who wants to be number one has got to be the slave of all because the son of man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to mm. give his life as a ransom for many. Wow, you yeah. get the atonement theology inside the redefinition of power and, and vice versa. And yeah. then in John's gospel, it's the foot washing scene. <sighs> this is what power looks like. Jesus washing the disciples feet and then going off to do the same thing on the cross. Um, and John doesn't, sort of draw the conclusion in a, a wooden way. He doesn't say at the end of chapter 19, so that's how Jesus demonstrated his power. John wants you to be a good reader and work that out for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Is, that's yeah. what he, but then when Jesus is raised from the dead, commissions his followers to go into the world in the power of the spirit, we know if we've been reading the story right, oh, I see, this is what power looks like they have to go and be for the world what Jesus was for Israel. They have to go and confront the rulers of the world in the power of the spirit, the way Jesus confronted Pontius Pilate and maybe at the same cost, et cetera. So that, that's, that's, it's tough. Uh, I, yeah. I don't claim it isn't tough, but that's where it yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. Eighth day of creation has been launched and, uh, Absolutely. go step into it. Yeah. Go step into this new reality in the middle of this one. That's all. Oh, thank you. This has been such a rich time. I just really thank appreciate you. Con well, thank conversation. You.